it is great to have everyone with us. Um, if you've been with us throughout this series, uh, welcome back. If you're new with us this morning, we're so glad for you to be joining us for the Living with Loss, Playing the Hands Your Adult series. Uh, my name is Amy Kostelik, and I am an, ex an Associate Extension Professor for Adult Development Aging. And with me is Mindy McCauley, who is the Extension Specialist for Instructional Support although Mindy stays a little bit more behind the scenes, but together we have been hosting um, this series, which started on April 20th. We have um, four more sessions to go on May 6th. We have Creative Outlets for Grief, and we've got a panel similar to what we've got today. On May 13th, Nicole Huff will be talking with us about financial resiliency. On May 20th, well, again, we have another team who's going to be talking about mental health, and in particular, um, suicide and substance use. And then we'll wrap the series up with Natalie Jones, who's going to talk with us about self-care and outdoor physical activity as we hopefully set sail into, into a nice um, summer and, and great weather. Um, before I officially introduce today's speakers, I'd like to just review, as usual, a couple of housekeeping rules. And the, the biggest one is if you could just please keep your microphones on mute. We know a lot of stuff goes on in the background and that can just help alleviate some distraction. And our, our panel today also did say that we've got such a variety of topics that if you've got questions, please ask them as they arise. Mindy and I will be monitoring both the chat and the Facebook Live. And so um, we can interject as well. Or if you feel comfortable, just unmute yourself and ask that question. And that way we can be sure that um, every, everyone's questions are being addressed. So um, it is a pleasure for me to have with us today several extension food and nutrition specialists, again, all from the University of Kentucky, and they are going today to help us explore living with loss and eating well. And so I'm going to let each person introduce themselves. This department and this crew has so many accomplishments, including so many awards, grant dollars, professional memberships. There's just so many to summarize. So thank you all for introducing yourselves, and thanks for being here um, this morning to share with us. Courtney, do you want to kick us off? I will. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Courtney Luking, and I'm an assistant extension professor in the Department of Dietetics and Human Nutrition. And I am here to support um, our agents and you all across the state, um, particularly in nutrition and health for those who are in the prenatal to preschool period. And so I'm Sandra Baskin. I'm a full extension professor in the Department of Dietetics and Human Nutrition. I've been at the university for 25 years. So um, uh, Courtney is starting out where I was many years ago, and it's exciting to see such wonderful uh, people uh, taking our places. Um, I'm still here to answer questions about nutrition, but my um, first love is food preparation as I was a chef in my former life. And um, I'm especially interested in uh, teens and young adults. Hi, I'm Ann Hall Morris. I'm the Food Preservation Extension Specialist with Family and Consumer Sciences. And I, uh, my love is canning and food preservation. And I spent um, most of my career as a food manufacturing inspector. So now that I'm working for UK, I help Kentucky farmers produce food, value added foods for sale at the farmer's market through our home-based microprocessing program. Good morning, you all. I'm Janet Mullins and like Dr. Baston, I'm coming up on 25 years in this position. It is my pleasure to work with you all and to support local foods and healthy eating and food security so we can make sure that all Kentuckians have access to healthy food and can feed themselves and their families. Great. Thanks, you all, for introducing yourselves. And I, I do have to ask a question though before we officially get started into the, the, the formal presentation because I know that when I'm under stress, when I'm grieving, I do not eat well. And I would assume because of the nature of your work that maybe you all do, but maybe I'm wrong. So I wondered if each of you could mention something that you have done to alleviate stress and, um, and help you through grief and loss just on a personal note to get us started. Yeah, so Amy, I'm with you. I um, 
I do not tend to eat as well when I'm stressed. So we can break the, maybe the perceived stereotype that nutrition and dietetics professionals can eat healthy all the time. Um, so I would say one of, I'll share two quick things. My biggest stress reliever is to get outside and take a, a, a breath of fresh air. Um, that's one of them. And then the other has been to um, gift people food. That's my food related stress reliever um, to share with those who might also have a need um, to hopefully relieve some stress for them in a time to eat good, healthy food when they need it. So um, I, like Courtney, like to get outside. We have a place actually set out in the back uh, yard where we have lots of trees and flowers and we eat out there. So that's a very calming spot for us to eat. And it's a place where I go when I need to uh, reflect. Um, I have a tendency to um, not eat when I'm stressed. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna lose any weight. It simply means that I'm not gonna eat well. So uh, I uh, make sure that when there are odd things happening in my life that cause me to be uh, stressed or in um, experiencing grief is that I have people prepare meals for me um, for a certain period of time until I can get back on my feet and I'm uh, a little less reflective. Well, I'm gonna join in with uh, Courtney and Sandra and uh, say that um, personally, I like to be outside also, and I, I have a new pet, and I've been walking the dog, and that has actually been an additional source of stress for me, <laughs> walking the dog, and so one of the ways that I like to calm down is to walk by myself with my uh, music or a podcast, and so I make it a point to do that every day once without the dog, just my podcast and me, and it doesn't matter if it's raining, if it's hot, if it's cold, I, I like to be outside and uh, just be walking and get that breath of fresh air. Well, I guess I'll be a little different. Um, during this time period, I have had more time to, because we've been healthy at home. So I have had more time in the kitchen to prepare meals that include a lot of vegetables and fruits and things like that. And so um, we have been really enjoying good, healthy food during this time period. And I have to say, it does feel good when you treat yourself right, when you eat lots of really nutrient rich foods. Um, we might not have been able to get fresh fruit as often um, because we don't go to the grocery store as often, but we keep it in the freezer. And um, so berries and yogurt, all kinds of things um, that we might not have indulged in before this time period um, we have done. And then also we have taken more time to be outside walking on a daily basis um, to get out and commune with nature and um, to realize that we're not alone in this journey, that we're all in this together. I feel kind of bad after Janet just talked. <laughs> I'm teasing. I, you know, it's funny. I will, I, I will throw in on, on for me, we typically in this house eat really healthy, but we have not during the pandemic, even though we do have more time and we are out like in hall with the dog. But I'll tell you what, I raid the freezers at Trader Joe's and then I'll just catch myself during the middle of the day, making a whole bag of something frozen that I've thrown in the microwave or I'll throw a genie badget under the bus because she put it in the chat box, you know, or going to Oreos. I haven't made cookies. I couldn't tell you when we just have store-bought cookies. These new little lemon wafers that we found are delicious. <laughs> um, so please, can you talk to us about why is it so difficult for some people to eat well when we're dealing with traumatic experiences? Because I don't think that's an uncommon thought or process for people. You're right, Amy. Um, there, there are actually a number of reasons that it can be difficult to eat well when we're dealing with traumatic experiences. And one big factor in that is stress and just generally uncomfortable emotions or feelings that we are processing or maybe have processed for quite some time over the last year. 
And these negative emotions can actually impact the decisions we make um, and, and in general, our behaviors. And this includes the behaviors that guide our decisions about whether to eat, what to eat, and how much to eat. And these constant levels of higher than normal um, stress hormones that are kind of circulating throughout our body can increase our desire to eat foods that are higher in sugar or sodium or fat. And that's because they, these types of foods provide a reward. They make us feel good when we eat them. So if we think about those comfort foods, they, they might be really rich foods. They might be really salty, like crunchy, salty foods or really sweet foods. And so if you think about how you feel when you even think about those foods, but especially when you eat them, they can be rewarding. So the first thing is stress and just the impact that it has on the decisions that we make and increasing our desire to eat comfort foods. The second kind of category is how the loss that we've experienced has impacted our daily routines. These could be things that are seemingly small or significant. And so I want us all to just take a moment and reflect on, um, you know, what, what has changed in our life in the last year? Maybe it's the people in our life, the places we've gone or not gone, um, or how we spend our time. And thinking about how that's impacted our daily routine um, and how meals and snacks are a part of our daily routine. And so I'll talk about a few examples there. Um, those with caregiving and work responsibilities became pressed for time in the last year. And so convenient foods, like you mentioned, the frozen foods or boxed foods, or even going through a drive through this offered a way to save time or, or a perception of a way to save time while still making sure everyone was fed. I know that's something <laughs> that was experienced in my house. Um, however, these options are typically less healthy and over time they can take a toll on our physical and mental health. For those who maybe had changes in income, they became pressed for resources or being able to just access enough food. And so rightfully so, having any food to eat became the priority regardless of the nutritional value. And then finally, those who've lost loved ones may be feeling unsure how to proceed, um, maybe because that was their partner who took the lead in planning or preparing meals. Or maybe if it's just you now, it, it might be less motivating to cook for one, or maybe you just don't know where to start. Um, and so as we can see, there, there are really a number of reasons that it can be difficult to eat healthy when we're stressed. So that leads me to ask too, um, you know, if we eat some of these foods because they're comfort foods, like you said, or they just taste good, or they, you know, at least we think temporarily that they're satisfying, or maybe we think they're more affordable, can eating actually then improve our mental and physical health if we eat well? Oops, you're muted, Sandra. Myself, there we go. Um, it is a uh, research does am I on there? I can't see for some reason. Um, research does show that uh, we can improve our mental and physical health. And there are lots of different ways that we each find to do that. Um, but one of the easiest ways that I find is by preparing meals at home. Um, I'm not much on eating out anyway, but cooking for yourself gives you greater control over the ingredients uh, in your meals. You can go to the farmer's market. You can look for fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, you can find new places to shop. Um, simple, healthy, home-cooked meals can also help you lower your risk for serious illness. Um, we know that um, getting more calcium in your diet improves your, uh, 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 decreases the risk for osteoporosis. Um, uh, We're finding out that phytochemicals can help reduce our risk for uh, cancer. So there's a lot of research that shows that if you can eat more healthily, you can boost your energy, you can sharpen your, your mind and, and your thought processes, you can lose weight if that's what you're looking for, and you can improve how you manage your stress, your anxiety, and your depression if you're uh, lean towards those, um, those kinds of activities. So getting all the nutrients you need isn't the only thing necessary for good health, though. Um, there are guidelines for good health recommended um, for physical activity, and that is uh, recommended at about 30 minutes uh, most days of the week. And the activity doesn't have to be anything structured. It can be anything from walking. Anne Hall walks her dog. She walks herself. Um, 
I uh, walk as well, but I also do a little uh, flower gardening. I also take a swim every night when everybody else has left the gym. So the benefits of uh, regular physical activity and eating healthfully can reduce the risk of chronic disease along with improving your outlook on your daily life. So as I mentioned earlier, I work with older adults and eating and food becomes a big part. I think it's a big part of our lives throughout our lifespan, but in older adulthood in particular, I know for me, I've seen some older adults who maybe are um, living alone. They may have lost a spouse or they've got maybe some health concerns or issues. I know with the pandemic, a lot of our congregate dining was not happening. And so people were having to eat in their apartments or their rooms by themselves. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we can get or how people, whether they're old or young, um, if they're dining alone, can get back into eating healthy and socializing? Because again, I think, I guess what I was trying to say is, you know, I feel like a lot of what we do when we eat is with other people. So what if you're by yourself? Well, yes, Amy, that's a, a great question. And I do have um, some suggestions on how to socialize um, and connect through food. I think food is a great way to connect with people. And um, now that uh, some of the restrictions have been lifted and um, most everyone has the vaccine, I think a, a great way to connect is to invite a friend or a neighbor over to cook with you, maybe even share in the cooking responsibilities. A lot of good conversations um, are had, chopping vegetables and preparing something to go in the oven and then sharing the meal with that person. Um, that is a great way to connect over food. And so um, I also like to try new recipes. I find myself stuck in a rut um, preparing the same meals throughout the week for dinner. Um, so I welcome a new recipe. Uh, sometimes my family doesn't always welcome that new recipe. They'll say, don't ever make that again. Um, but I do like to try new recipes. And that's, that's a great way to take the initiative. Uh, try a new recipe with, with a new vegetable in it that you might not have had. Um, invite someone in to help you prepare that meal and then share that meal with them. And then also um, mix it up a little, be creative, um, dine outside. You can uh, prepare that meal and then um, eat on the back porch or Sandra has that space in her yard where she likes to eat. Um, I have a, a local Chinese restaurant that I just love and they're not open for, for dine-in yet. So we do like to pick up our, our to-go orders and just take it to the park. Um, people watch. So you, you don't always have to prepare something at home. You can get takeout and then uh, take it somewhere and just be in that environment. It's, it's a great way to ease back into socializing. I love some of those ideas in hall. My mom um, lives by, her, by herself since my dad passed away. And I know there have been times where she's not wanted to invite a friend over because she'll say, well, I don't know if they would like what I would make or or, you know, she'll come up with an excuse. And so I've told her, well, why don't you make something like pizzas? And then it's interactive. People can make their own individual pizza and put whatever you want on it. You can have healthy choices. And, and it could be, you know, kind of a fun um, thing to do as well as eat, as well as socialize. And I, I think that's some of what I heard you say too. You know, be creative and think outside the box. So Janet, Amy, I was hoping, Amy, let, me, let me add a little something here. So some of us are still on social media. We're not getting out. And you can still use things like Zoom. My 85-year-old mother is playing bridge on Zoom. And they are having a snack midway through together. And they each have the same snack. And then she's still eating. Um, uh, she has people that she would normally eat with, but she's dining with them on Zoom. And sometimes they have DoorDash um, deliver the same item. And so it's, um, it's, there are still uh, opportunities if you are still in, in for you to do these same kinds of things that we're suggesting. So I just wanted to make sure that people knew that that is an, another creative alternative. I'm so glad you said that, Sandra. And that's true. I, I don't mean to always talk about my own mom, but Mother's Day is coming up on the 10th. And we're going to do the same thing that we've done with a couple of other holidays and celebrations with her, where my sister and her family get on the Zoom and we get on and we have something sent to her house, a, a meal delivered. And then we all eat brunch together as if we were together. And it is. It's, it's, my mom would say, you know, if this is the best we can do, I'm so glad to have 
to have this and you still share and socialize over food, like Ann Hall was saying, that's what we, excuse me, that's what we like to do. Um, Janet, you were so gracious at the very beginning to talk about some of your habits and, and how you deal with stress. And so I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on that a, a bit more and talk about some mindful eating practices that can help us be a, a more aware of our food and healthy food choices. I'm, I know not everyone thinks about food as much as I do, <laughs> but that's one of the joys of being able to do a job like this. I come from a long line of food. Both my sets of grandparents ran restaurants. And so we are really um, a food oriented crew. And I think part of being mindful about eating and part of the reason that I enjoy being in the kitchen so much is because that's where my people come from. And during times of loss and widespread illness, if we can become more aware of the food choices that we're making, that can be very powerful. It can give a, you know, that is something that we can control and that will benefit ourselves and the people that we care about. And so by intentionally selecting the foods that nourish your body, you may find that it gives you greater strength to live each day as it comes. And that's what mindfulness is all about. You know, you have to be here now. The only thing we really have is the present. And so when the world slowed down, and um, all that came with the pandemic, 2020 invited us to take time to enjoy food while honoring um, the losses of the world and the people that are in it that we care about. Um, one of the things that registered dietitians advise their clients about right now is to take up a more intuitive approach to eating. And so use your intuition. Um, there, you know, most of us know what is healthier or better for us. And you also know what you feel like um, and what you are capable of doing right this very minute. And so intuitive eating can be a great approach to be flexible and practice self-care. And while we eat primarily to keep our bodies fueled, you know, it has to, it's something just like physical activity that you have to do on a daily basis. Can't build it up, have to do it every day. And so that's a, a good reason to make eating and activity things that you approach mindfully. Um, when you don't enjoy eating as much as you used to, that can be a little disconcerting. And um, some of us turn to eating as a coping mechanism for dealing with grief and loss. So know thyself and a good way to know yourself is to take time to be mindful, be in the moment, maybe do some contemplative reflection about why do I feel this way? Why am I eating this? Why am I not eating that? And so if you can try to eat regularly be physically active every day, get some restful sleep, then you're setting yourself up with a formula for healing and coming out of this pandemic stronger than you went in. I like that, Janet. It reminds me of my dad. He used to really treat his body like a machine and he would say, you've got to take care of it or like a baseball glove. If you don't take care of it, it won't last. And so I remember even as a small child, he would say things to us like, you don't eat it because you like it. You eat it because it's good for you. And I, I remember that. And I think there is um, some, some power, power to that. So Courtney, can you help us maybe explore ways that we can make our meals and set snacks more nutritious, um, but maybe so that um, we both like it and it's good for, <laughs> good for us. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. There are so many different kinds of foods out there, but really the foods that are best for our body are, they boil down to those good old food groups that we learned about maybe when we were in elementary or middle school. And so you can get self-care every time you eat. So thinking about the number of times you typically eat in a day and how much opportunity is provided to you to take care of yourself. 
And so a way to go about this is to really incorporate a variety of foods, meaning a variety of grains, which are shown on the bottom of this kind of old school food pyramid, if you will. And, and whole grains in particular are going to provide us with those vitamins and minerals um, that are going to give an added bonus rather than like white bread, for example. So choosing a whole grain bread over white bread is going to give your body more nourishment. Um, we also want to get a variety of fruit and vegetables. And so eating a rainbow is a lovely visual to think about and having a rainbow on your plate for anyone with young children or kiddos in their life out there, the more variety of colors on a plate, it supports kind of a greater exposure and, and greater intake of a variety of foods among children. So try to get, you know, instead of having an all white plate or an all yellow plate, for example, ensure that you're getting splashes of color from that rainbow. And knowing that you can choose like fresh, but also frozen and even canned are great opportunities as well. We're rolling into seasons where local foods are going to be available. And so you can take advantage of that, but know that there are other options depending on what your resources and time and, um, and access are. And then we want to make sure that we have uh, protein. So this can include eggs. It can include beans and nuts. So there's like plant sources of protein that can be really powerful. And you can also get protein from animal foods. So lean meats like um, poultry or pork or beef and, and fish as well. And then we also have our dairy options. So those low fat dairy options. So eating a combination of these. And so what I mean by a combination, at least two different food groups at a snack and at least three different food groups at a meal is really a way to ensure that you are nourishing your body with energy, um, but know that you have the flexibility to, flexibility to choose what those foods are within each food group, right? So it's not like you have to eat bananas if you don't like bananas, for example. Just choose a fruit that brings um, joy or pleasure to your palate, if you will. Um, and you can really, the combinations are endless for the ways that you can nourish your body and feel good um, and enjoy the flavor of what you eat. So just realistically, I've got a question. You know, if my go-to, let's say, is a bowl of M&Ms, and I won't just eat five. I mean, I can eat an entire bag as I'm sitting and working or riding or Zooming. So how do you train yourself to not reach for the M&Ms and instead reach for some grapes or some nuts? Because I, I would think there's like a transition there where all of a sudden the grapes and the nuts are preferable to the M&Ms because right now my preference is the M&Ms. I totally understand. And so what I would say, it's a yes and no need to deprive yourself. But if you really want that piece of chocolate, can you pair some nuts with it? Um, so that you have a little bit of chocolate and something that will also bring nourishment um, and be just be kind of round out that combination or, you know, uh, some fruit with some nut butter, for example, and then sprinkle a couple mini chocolate chips on there. I like to do that for my daughter because, again, it gets her kind of a sweet treat, um, but is still providing by and large um, the nourishment that she needs to grow and develop. Thanks, Courtney. Sandra, I know I've talked a little bit about loss and I know that you've suffered some recent losses um, as well lately. Do you have any personal experiences that have helped you feel better that you would be willing to share? Well, I, I do. Um, uh, our family was really big on raising our own food. Uh, we had, my grandfather had an acre garden. He thought he was responsible for um, feeding everyone fruits and vegetables in the neighborhood. So that was really my first introduction um, of him. He would hand me whatever was left and I would sell it on the corner and that money went towards um, my education later on. Uh, but we also went fishing, we went hunting. Um, I, I think on Facebook not too long ago, there was a Southern woman um, list of foods. You know, you know you're Southern if you've eaten all these foods. And my friends were saying they'd eaten five or 10 or uh, a few more than that maybe. And I'd eaten all of them. I'd had the squirrel brains in the, the eggs fried from in the morning. Um, I'd had the, the mush, I'd had the pickled pig's feet because we were um, into growing our own stuff and making sure that we used it all. So um, I don't know if that means I'm a Southern woman or not, but it does mean that lots of variety is a really important thing in our um, eating patterns. But one of the ways that, um, uh, that I use food that helps me heal is uh, spending time in the kitchen and cooking my favorite um, 
family meals. If you look on the slide, um, there's, a, there's a favorite for everybody in the family up there. Um, my daughter loves to bake bread. My husband loves to bake cookies. My son loves um, to, to put up jams and applesauce. And then um, probably my favorite food is uh, chicken and dumplings. My grandmother used to make that really often for us. There's a, a, a um, my daddy's favorite meal is up there. There's a coca vin down there at the bottom. And then my mama really likes healthy salads that have fruits and cheeses and that kind of thing. And that's represented there too. So I've kind of got everybody's favorite um, in that picture. And you'll notice up at the top also that there's a nice uh, setting. So even if we are um, fixing chicken and dumplings, our table is, um, is something special. And we are looking forward to um, eating together and it's kind of an event. And so even if we're out in the back porch, uh, there is a, either water running or there's um, uh, candles or there's music or maybe we're just listening to the birds, but there's always something that makes it a little bit of a special touch. Um, research does indicate that food aroma can engage your senses and bring comforting memories for many people. Um, I, I smell chicken and dumplings or chi anything chicken, chicken and noodle soup, and I immediately have to smile and think of all the times I spent at the, the table with my grandparents. Um, so taking time to carefully prepare um, and then fully enjoy the foods or meals that, that have been a significant part of your life are a wonderful way to honor your loved ones. And there's nothing better than the enticing smell of your loved one's favorite foods. Uh, so I have many handwritten recipes and some old cookbooks that I cherish. It allows me to carry on those traditions and create some lasting memories for my own children. Um, they, at, when they started cooking, they would call and say, what's the recipe for? And, you know, that made my heart sing because it meant that they were going to carry on the traditions that we have set up um, their whole entire life. Um, Nothing makes me feel better than preparing my grandmother's chicken and dumplings, like I said, with a side of glazed carrots um, or uh, catching a perch. Um, my dad loved to fish. Um, that really, really makes me happy. So these recipes bring back memories of warm kitchens and uh, days at the lakes and gardening with my grandfather. And so being able to smile about these adventures in the kitchen go a long way in um, my healing um, with my grief. Oh, Sandra, that just warms my heart. I think it's a way too that you can help keep people alive in your heart or their memories to keep going to pass those traditions down to next generations. I recently, well, not too recently, but I saw that you can take some of those handwritten recipes. I'm sure everyone on the Zoom probably has seen this and have them put on dishes or pie plates or tea towels. And then you can see, you know, like my grandmother's handwriting or your mom's recipe for the chicken dumplings. I, I think that is such a neat way because only one person can have the original, you know, right. recipe card that's got all the stains on it and everything, which is, you know, so, so fabulous. I have a couple of those actually framed that, that I, that I use and, and have on display. So there's so much gratitude. Um, I think that comes with food and, and, you know, healing, whether we're um, giving, receiving gratitude, food certainly seems like it's a great place to start. So sharing is caring, you all. Yeah, and one of the things that we can do with foods um, is to try and help people in our communities who are struggling to keep their own pantries stocked. And uh, like Amy was saying, gratitude can be healing. Um, there are uh, countless studies that show that practicing gratitude can make a difference in our stress levels and in our quality of sleep. And so um, one of the ways that I like to um, practice gratitude is to prepare a meal for a neighbor. Um, Sandra said that when she is in times of stress or um, experiencing loss that, that she may not eat like she should and, and she would uh, rather have a meal prepared for her. And so, 
since uh, we, we would be cooking for ourselves, you know, it's nice to make a little extra and then maybe take a meal to someone down the street. And, and don't just do it when, when they're in times of need. Um, it's nice to be pleasantly surprised uh, with a banana bread or some cookies um, or even a new recipe that you're trying out and you're just gonna give to the neighbor down the street. Um, another way to practice gratitude is to write thank you notes. I'm trying to instill that in my kids right now uh, to, to put that in writing and put it in the mail. You know, don't just call or text or send an email. There is something special about a handwritten thank you note. And now is a good time to um, say thanks to our essential workers. You know, I, I know they appreciate um, the, the thank you notes, the handwritten notes, or even the cookies. And I have also started keeping a gratitude journal. At the beginning of the webinar, Amy, you ask, what are we doing you know, to cope with loss? And I like Sandra's example, Ann Hall walks herself and, and I do. I do walk myself every day. The dog might not get it every day, but I walk myself every day. And I've also started keeping a gratitude journal. Some days are better than others. I'll flip back through that. Uh, last month, I had some days that only had one or two things on them. And oddly enough, it was the dog that I was thankful for. But each, each day, um, writing that down and then looking back on that, it, it is helping me uh, to cope with a recent loss. And so I would say that uh, practicing gratitude can be healing. So we're thankful for so many things in our lives. We're thankful for neighbors. We're thankful for you guys to give us all these tips and pointers today. Um, and we know that there are a lot of people struggling with all sorts of losses. Um, and especially within this past year, there've just been so such a wide range really of hits for people. Do you have suggestions on, additional suggestions on how we can further support um, individuals? Well, one of the ways that people in the community where I grew up in far Western Kentucky would support people during a time of loss um, was through what we call funeral foods. And so um, people would come with a special pie maybe that was made by a, a gifted baker in our community. And uh, it would be all specially packaged in this aluminum foil pyramid. And you would see that pyramid going through the parking lot or somebody walking down the street. And you'd know that some family was going to get one of those pies. Um, and that they probably needed that support from their community right then. Some communities keep blessing boxes now that are stocked with pantry staples for anybody who needs food. People just stop by and put things in there and people just stop by and get things that they need. And that's what a community is all about. You know, we had times like this where we see the great, great need. Um, our neighbors may not come out and tell us directly that they're in need, but you see long lines at food distribution operations and at food banks and so even at a distance, even being healthy at home, we can help by sharing and giving and receiving comforting foods during this time of loss. There's a line in the movie Steel Magnolias um, where one of the women is looking for a casserole to make that freezes beautifully. And she has to go get the ingredients for that casserole because it freezes beautifully. And Caring neighbors can really look for recipes that are freezable, that a family can pull out when cooking sounds like it's just too much. They'll have that as a backup and it'll be in the freezer. Um, there are also online tools um, that we've used lately, like meal trains for families where different people can sign up to support them. Um, and it can be for a time of joy, as well as for a time of loss, like when somebody has a new baby. So there are all kinds of high tech and low tech ways um, that we can support people with the gift of food. And you know, you can bring fresh fruit, 
you can go pick up a favorite takeout meal and deliver that with a smile to bring joy both to the people that are receiving your gift and it will also bring great joy to you. Janet, I get a kick out of that. I was recently this winter, a recipient of some casseroles and things that got delivered. And I will say I got in, in addition to being so um, really just dumbfounded at the thoughtfulness of people to bring things to us. I was also so, um, I was so tickled by what people brought because a lot of times it was like, a Sandra Baston bringing her mom's chicken dumpling soup because it was like, this is, this is what I grew up on when I was injured or when I was sick or this brought healing to my family or there might've been a different casserole, but everyone had a story for what they brought based on what it meant to them and their family, or this was a tradition in all our culture. And so this is why we're bringing this to you. And it really was so touching. I, it really honestly made me rethink about the way in which I might bring my next casserole or why I choose what dish I choose, whether it's because of the freezer or it's because, you know, Mima said, this is what, you know, heals a broken bone or whatever it, whatever it may be. Well, you guys have certainly given us so much to think about. And I thank you all so much. We all do for, again, giving us some ideas to move us forward as we, um, you know, navigate our own losses, our own, you know, types of grief. Um, and really too, as we all yearn to get back to what normal is or what our new normal may be, um, the losses and hardships of this past year in particular, um, no doubt are going to make the post-pandemic world um, a different place for all of us from the pre-pandemic one. And I think learning from opportunities like this, we certainly learn how to strengthen our own selves, our families, and our communities. So thank you so much for being a part of this. And um, to, the, to, to those of you who are with us today, are there any questions before we put a wrap on this? Please unmute your mic or share, share something, share your casserole that works for you. <laughs> this is the time to do it. Amy, I remember from our kickoff session, our guest speaker, Dr. Bowman, mentioned funeral potatoes. That's right. Been a, a popular in Minnesota. And I, I, I often think about funeral potatoes. And I think I've shared on it just as people might be thinking or just getting off. That's fine, too. But I remember um, when we had a death in our family, there was a World War II vet that came over and he just didn't know what to do, but he wanted to do something. And he'd gone over to like a Sam's Club or a Costco kind of place. And he brought over this giant container of nuts. I've never seen such a big mixed, mixed container of nuts. And it was kind of funny. It was like, what the heck? And you could tell that he even kind of felt silly about it, but it was like, I want to bring something. He wasn't going to make anything, but I'll tell you what I have brought nuts to people since then, because it, you know, there's so many people in and out of your house and you don't necessarily, not everyone wants to sit down and eat the casseroles that were brought. So it was so easy to just munch on these nuts and just have them out. And I thought those were one of the best things that, that were brought over to us. And I've done the exact same thing, a giant awkward container of nuts, with a little note to say, you're going to like these. <laughs> That's a great idea. I have a friend that always takes um, disposable containers because you always have so much food that you want to send it home with other people too. So that's always a good thing. A good we idea. have a question on Facebook. Um, what do you do for people who are picky? Good question. Well, I think I answered that there as well, Nancy, um, Mindy. I, I usually make a potato soup because there's not too many people that don't like potatoes. Um, spaghetti is often uh, uh, popular, especially if they have kids, um, and I can throw meatballs in there pretty easily. So those are my go-tos for people who are really picky. But usually I just call and say, what can I bring you that would, um, would make life easier for you? And usually they'll tell me. So um, since I have the gift in the kitchen of being able to cook, I can cook a wide variety of things. Um, but I also have um, in my freezer... Um, when I make um, lasagna, I usually have a little bit left, you know, enough for four. And so I put that in the freezer. If I don't give it away right away, um, I, I have that available for someone who maybe is getting a lot of things all at once. 
but they are already they can already have something in the freezer. And people who've heard me talk throughout the series, Sandra, have heard me say this, you know, you, especially with when there's a, you know, hospitalization or there's a death, there's so much care and concern that happens those first couple of weeks, but the next couple of months, sometimes and I don't want to say anyone's ever forgotten, but the cast will stop, but you still are healing or you're still hurting. And so sometimes out of the blue to have a lasagna for four that's delivered two months down the road can be kind of nice and, and really can warm someone's heart. That's a great idea to freeze the leftovers of, well, you know, when you're making it. That's one of the things I also do. Sometimes I don't take food. Sometimes I don't take anything. Sometimes after about two to three or four weeks, I call and say, how you doing? And usually there's a spot there in grieving where you, you're kind of in I don't know, denial or disbelief at first. And then maybe you start to um, realize that there's some things you need to do for yourself to get over uh, the loss or the move or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, but, and then a month later, everyone has already brought you your meals and you're sitting by yourself. I, I found this very often. So a lot of times um, I make a note on my, on my, um, calendar and say, go see so-and-so on such and such date or afterwards, because um, at that point, they may just need somebody to talk to or a smile or a hug. Yep. Absolutely. I also try to do that with um, the anniversary date of the loss, whether it was the death or the job or whatever it may be, the, the day a new job starts to have little celebrations to say, oh my gosh, you've been at this new job or, you know, we're, we're celebrating this transition because we're six months out or we're this or we're that. And I, I, I found that to be meaningful to, to do, kind of like Ann Hall was talking about, the giving and the taking of gratitude. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, thank you again, everyone, for participating, for listening, for sharing. Um, we, always, we always learn something and it's always more fun with food. <laughs>